All right, first question, what are some recommended supplements for people in their 40s? So I think that there are some supplements that would be more beneficial to take if you are older. Now, 40s is still very young. I think there is not a lot of uh, physiological differences between people and their health between 30s, 40s. And only starting in your 50s, you start to see some of changes in hormones and other aspects of health that would warrant some like specific interventions or specific supplement protocols that would be more beneficial for those people. So I think people in their 40s, you know, you want to you want to take the same supplements in your 40s as you would take in your 30s because there's not a lot of differences in your, uh, you know, let's say muscle mass and VO2 max, uh, like drastic differences. But in your 50s, there will be some more like uh, significant uh, changes. Now, what are the supplements in your 50s, like whether is going to start to have some changes in your hormones and health, then uh, I have made some posts actually on uh, Twitter as well about the supplements I would start to take uh, once I reach my 50s. And uh, those supplements are number one, glycine and NAC, I would still continue taking them. Right now, I'm not taking NAC on a daily basis, I'm taking it, you know, a few times a month or something. But I do take glycine daily for the collagen and glutathione benefits. But uh, I would add NAC in my 50s, because after the age of 40, 45, you see a decline in natural glutathione production because of age-related changes. And they find that even healthy individuals who are otherwise healthy, they have a healthy diet, a healthy body composition, even these people see a decline in glutathione levels because of the natural process of aging. So in your 50s, you would benefit from a higher let's say, support for glutathione production and glycine and NAC are the best precursors for that. And we have a lot of clinical trials as well. The combination of glycine and NAC has been shown to like reduce some of the hallmarks of aging or aspects of that, including inflammation, uh, waist circumference, uh, increase uh, grip strength, um, gait speed, cognition, and those kind of things. So I think it's a very effective supplement, cheap as well. And you would technically start to benefit more from glycine and NAC on a daily basis after the age of 50 or after the age of 45, depending on your health status. But I personally will start taking glycine and NAC on a daily basis. So I would add NAC on a daily basis. So I'll at least take 2.5 grams of NAC daily, plus at least 2.5 grams of glycine, but I'm taking, you know, already 10 grams of glycine nowadays. So yeah, I would just add the extra NAC to there. The third supplement would be melatonin because melatonin levels also decline with age. Now the decline in melatonin already starts after puberty. So in your 20s already, you're producing a significantly less amount of melatonin than you did in your teenage years. And once you reach your 50s and more significantly in your 70s and 80s, you see a much greater drop in melatonin levels. So I'm not taking melatonin daily right now because I sleep well, my body is producing still adequate amounts of melatonin, maybe not optimal amounts, even in your 20s, but I'm not taking it every day. In my 50s, I will start taking melatonin like every day, and I would increase the dosage as well. So right now, in my 20s, late 20s, uh, and in my 30s, I'll get away with like 0 0.3, 0 0.5 milligrams of melatonin to reach the optimal level of melatonin. And uh, in my 50s, I will probably increase it to like one milligram every day. And in my 70s and 80s, probably I would increase it even more. So like 1.5 milligrams because people in their 70s and 80s, they produce like a fraction of the melatonin that you produced when you were 20 years old as well. So the older you get there, the greater the decline in melatonin tends to be. And this decline in melatonin isn't like inherently a good thing. Melatonin has benefits on sleep. It has other benefits as well in terms of antioxidant defense and anti-inflammatory status. So I think that um, melatonin is like a longevity hormone in that sense and an anti-aging hormone so uh, yeah i'm definitely going to start taking melatonin regularly when i reach uh, 50. the fourth supplement i will take would be creatine definitely so if you're young then you technically don't need creatine either because you already have you know relatively speaking a higher amount of muscle mass and muscle strength and muscle speed and cognitive function as well and bone density so you, know, you technically don't need creatine in your 20s and 30s even 40s perhaps it doesn't mean that you wouldn't benefit from taking creatine. You would just have slightly higher muscle strength and uh, and other ben you get the other benefits of creatine as well. So you're like optimizing it in your 20s, 30s, 40s. But after the age of 50, your health status declines slightly. Specifically, you see a decline in muscle mass, muscle strength, 
and bone density also starts to slightly deteriorate by that age. So at that age, in the 50s, creatine is yeah, like a health span supplement that uh, protects against some of that decline. So I'm a pretty big fan of creatine for that reason. And uh, I would take it more consistently in my 50s, 60s and 70s. So right now I do take creatine not every day because I'm also trying to like maximize my VO2 max or trying to increase my VO2 max uh, currently. And uh, I'm all, I mean, I don't technically need to increase my VO2 max anymore because it's uh, very high already, but I'm just, you know, in my age, I'm trying to, okay, you know, it's all downhill from here in terms of VO2 max. So VO2 max peaks when you're 18 years old. And naturally speaking, you know, my VO2 max is much higher right now than it was when I was 18. So it doesn't mean that you can't have a high VO2 max even later in life, but it just means that, you know, starting on from 30s, 40s, it's going to be harder to have a higher VO2 max as well. So right now I'm kind of reaping the benefits of a high VO2 max to build a buffer or a build a, like a reserve for that. And uh, later in my 50s, the shift, in my opinion, should be more towards muscle mass and bone density because um, that's where more harm comes from for uh, people after the age of 50. So that's where I'll focus more on creatine. And uh, creatine has cognitive benefits as well. So it's been shown to improve memory function in elderly people. So yeah, if you're like 70, 80 years old, like I would definitely take, give creatine to your grandparents and parents uh, because uh, it's very cheap, safe and effective. So it's one of the most effective supplements for, uh, you know, physical performance and currently like cognitive performance as well. And lastly, the fifth supplement I'll start taking after the age of 50 is going to be natokinase. So uh, natokinase it uh, mostly has, has benefits for heart health and cardiovascular disease risk reduction. So it has antithrombotic, anti-blood coagulation effects and uh, anti-atherosclerotic effects. So there are a few clinical trials showing how natokinase potentially could reduce arterial plaque or um, the plaque accumulation. And it definitely has you know, protection, like reduces the the risk of thrombosis and those kind of things, which does tend to increase after the age of 50. So uh, men especially are at a higher risk of heart disease much sooner than women. So, uh, you know, natokinase is like a very cheap and effective supplement for, for that, in my opinion. And the dose would be at least 6,000 um, fibronolytic units and I uh, would probably start taking like 10,000 FUs uh, per day. So these are the list of the supplements I will take after my age of 50. You know, a lot of some of them I'm taking already right now. There might be a few other ones there that I'll add, but uh, these are the ones uh, I think is like the top five. Before I continue, I want to briefly mention to you about one of my favorite longevity gadgets, which is the Bond Charge Infrared Sauna Blanket. It's a cheaper and more convenient way to take the sauna anywhere at any time. I've talked a lot about the benefits of regular sauna use. I believe taking the sauna regularly is the second best thing for your longevity after exercise. In fact, the sauna mimics a lot of the health benefits of exercise. The sauna is also effective for excreting heavy metals and other chemicals we're exposed to on a daily basis. The Bond Charge infrared blanket is made of pure leather and it's low in EMF. It's got a rating of 4.9 out of 5 based on 176 reviews, which is crazy. But I'm not surprised because I'm using the blanket almost every day and it gets the same job done as a regular sauna. Plus, it's easy to clean and you can store it under your bed. Alright, back to the video. Next question, three simplest ways to increase VO2 max. So uh, VO2 max is something that uh, is worthwhile to increase. There's a lot of opinions about whether or not VO2 max is important, you know, based on the research that I've done and I've, you know, scoured the literature for, for uh, quite extensively. And uh, I do think that VO2 max is one of the best, like, uh, physiological markers of health span for sure. And, uh, you know, if you extend your health span, it also has some uh, effects on your lifespan. So how do you increase the VO2 max? There's many ways you can do it. There's no, I guess, uh, better or worse way. The most important thing to do is to just exercise, specifically some aspects of cardiovascular exercise. So if you just do more cardio, you're going to see an increase in your VO2 max. And uh, just doing more so adding more hours to the cardio, no matter how much you're doing right now, <laughs> will still tend to increase your VO2 max. Because if you look at the elite athletes, they you know exercise hours and hours per week, and they have the highest VO2 maxes out there. So uh, the more you do, the higher your VO2 max typically will be. But you know what is the kind of sweet spot or the bare minimum effective dose 
So if you do like hit cardio once a week, then that generally will give you benefits for increasing your VO2 max. And, but if you add more of some of the zone two workouts, or if you add an extra hit workout session, then you will see greater benefits uh, from there as well, almost like in a linear fashion. The issue is that if you do too much exercise, or if you add a lot of high intensive exercise to your workout plan, weekly workout plan, then you might see some of the symptoms of overtraining related to sleep, stress, your uh, glycemic like uh, levels or glucose levels can also worse, worse than if you're doing too much exercise. So you need to kind of figure out, okay, what is the sweet spot for you? But regardless, just doing more will increase your VO2 max. It's just that some of that may have some collateral uh, damage. But in my opinion, the sweet spot is yeah, like once a week, some sort of hit cardio, a short hit session, 20 to 30 minutes, and uh, one to two zone two cardio sessions as well once a week. The top three methods to do, so the, num so the first one would be I uh, just do more cardio, whatever type of cardio it is, hit or zone two cardio. The second method is to do this uh, longer intervals with your hit workout. So the research suggests that doing the hit intervals that last over two minutes uh, gives a greater increase in VO2 max than the intervals that last shorter than two minutes. So anything like two, four, six minutes, I think is the sweet spot for doing these intervals. So that means two to six minutes of 80 to 90% of your max heart rate in, this, in the interval. So that can be uh, running, uh, cycling, uh, rowing, whatever the kind of exercise you're doing, swimming. It's just you want to be 80 to 90% of your max heart rate for two to six minutes. I like the four minute intervals. I think it's pretty intense and... Uh, also like feels bearable or like yeah endurable <laughs> if you who have six minute intervals at 80 to 90 percent of your max heart rate then that's a pretty like pretty intense and hard to pull off two minute intervals are also pretty good um, but i think four minute intervals might be slightly superior so there's this norwegian method four minutes of this 80 to 90 percent max heart rate four minutes rest for four rounds so that uh, has quite a lot of research as well that it does uh, very effective for increasing VO2 max. So longer intervals uh, are better than shorter intervals. And you want to do them at the one to one ratio. So like if you do two minute interval, then you rest for two minutes or have like this uh, low intensity period for two minutes, and then you repeat it. But if you have a four minute interval, then you repeat, then you rest for four minutes as well. And the third method is to do more uh, low heart rate training. So this is usually called like zone two training especially, but it doesn't have to be always zone two even. Zone two is just, I guess, more effective in terms of that. But any form of low heart rate training is also beneficial for increasing your overall cardiorespiratory fitness. So the intervals are great for increasing VO2 max, but uh, sometimes some people might need to focus on their base. So this uh, uh, base uh, of their cardiorespiratory fitness, and that's best trained with a zone two or just lower heart rate training. So the low hundreds, so something between 100 to 120 beats per minute with your heart rate, that is um, one of the best ways to increase your base for your uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. And if you're older, then that number might be even lower. So if you're in your 60s, then your number for this could be you know, 80s, low 80s or uh, low 90s even. Next question, what will you do in your 30s that makes the biggest bang for your buck that is not exercise? So, uh, you know, I'm going to be 30 in one month. So, uh, you know, new decade, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I think I'm, uh, you know, much fitter than I was when I was 18. So my VO2 max is much higher than I was 18. My muscle mass, muscle strength, and all my biomarkers are all much optimal than they were back when I was 18 years old. So I guess, you know, technically speaking, many people would say that this is the peak. And after that, once I enter my 30s, this is where the decline begins with uh, health. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a very, you know, I'm a very consistent person. And I think that I'll maintain the same health and probably improve some aspects of my health, even in my 30s. And maybe my decline only begins my 40s. So we'll see. But what will I focus on or what will be, be the biggest bang for my buck in my 30s? So I'm already exercising quite a lot. And I think the second best thing for your health after exercise is uh, sauna, so regular sauna four times a week of uh, sauna is what I'm going to be aiming for. And I'm very bullish on uh, sauna therapy because I've just seen so many, so much research and so many studies over the last few years 
showing how uh, how big the risk reduction is for heart disease and Alzheimer's and all cause mortality from uh, regular sauna use. And I've you know mentioned it many times as well that it's not this kind of a healthy user bias that many people would like to think that people who take the sauna are just health conscious and that's why they uh, live longer. It's important to realize that yeah, the the research is done in Finland where everyone has pretty much access to the sauna. So Finland has a population of 5 million people and there's 3 million saunas in Finland. Almost everyone has a sauna at their home and every gym, every kind of office building and stuff has a sauna. So it's part of uh, culture. It's like a national identity to be um, a sauna person in Finland. So everyone takes a sauna very regularly. So that and that includes the normies. <laughs> that includes the people who are not taking care of their health at all. So they drink beer, they eat cheeseburger or whatever, just just regular people, they still go to the sauna and uh, they they uh, like uh, reap the benefits uh, from there. Now Finland still has a pretty high degree of like uh, heart disease compared to other uh, countries, but that's just because yeah, they you know, Finnish um, I guess diet culture or something like that isn't let's say the same as it is like in the Mediterranean countries. Uh, so to say, so the diet is slightly worse in Finland. So if they didn't do the sauna, then their probably rates of heart disease would be even uh, higher, <laughs> if that makes sense. For the, like just the average, uh, average a Finnish person who doesn't care about their health at all, if that makes sense. But uh, yeah, I'm very bullish about the sauna. I'm taking it already pretty regularly, but in my 30s, I think that would be the biggest bang for my buck uh, for cardiovascular health benefits uh, first and foremost. Next question, how to decrease stress levels, any breath method, supplements to deal with it. So uh, there was a recent um, meta-analysis in uh, 2024 that did look at all the different interventions for stress management and it found that the most effective ones were things like mindfulness and meditation-based interventions. So I think it matters less what type of meditation it is or what kind of mindfulness practice it is. It's just that uh, these practices tend to have benefits on stress and anxiety and um, and the kind of stress reduction. So if you are a person who has higher amounts of stress, then I think you would benefit from, you know, investigating some different types of med meditation. And, uh, you know, even like forest bathing can be a form of mindfulness. So the forest bathing in its technical term, so not just being in a forest and listening to a podcast, which can also be, of course, um, relaxing activity, but the forest bathing itself as a therapy, as it was originated in Japan, it also just involves being in the forest, not being uh, distracted by anything else and just kind of soaking in the environment, soaking in the sounds and the sights looking around and just kind of dwelling in the forest. So that is all, almost like a form of meditation or mindfulness. You just pay attention to the surroundings and uh, not be distracted by a podcast or uh, your smartphone. So the most authentic way of doing forest bathing would be to yeah just be in the forest and bathe in the forest as a form of like therapy or stress reduction, not just yeah walking in a forest with a podcast. <laughs> but you know with forest bathing, it's you know and with whatever meditation as well, any other form of stress reduction, you need to be aware of you know how does it affect you. Some people actually get more stressed out by being in a forest or they might get more stressed out or more anxious if they're meditating. So you need to yeah, figure out, okay, what does, what does work for you? Are there any supplements for stress reduction? So, you know, ashwagandha has quite a lot of uh, clinical trials that it does help with stress and anxiety. So I think that is probably the easiest and most effective supplement for stress reduction. It has quite nice uh, evidence. Some other supplements would be like maybe L-theanine that can help with anxiety and possibly glycine as well in my opinion. So it has this GABAergic effects so it can uh, make you more calm and uh, it does help with sleep as well. So you know I don't think adding a lot of supplements would be a, a wise move if you're stressed. It's more important to figure out what's the root cause of the stress and try to manage it as well as um, you know, do like more physical things in terms of that, like, you know, moderate exercise, maybe sauna can help with stress in some sense, getting enough sleep, you know, kind of the fundamentals are more important before using uh, supplements. But uh, the supplements that do work are ashwagandha, theanine, and uh, glycine, maybe magnesium as well, if you are you know, magnesium deficient. And stress does 
increase the demand for magnesium. Next question, I supplement with omega-3 high dose, but I eat many nuts as well. Is my omega-3 wasted? So omega-3s are obviously quite important and beneficial for health. Omega-6s that you get from nuts and seeds, you know, there are essential omega-6 fatty acids as well. So you don't necessarily want to eliminate all omega-6s, you know, at least you want at least not a whole food omega-6s. So eating a few nuts and seeds isn't inherently harmful as long as you are getting enough omega-3s. And the way to know that is to just uh, measure your omega-3 index. So that is the only way to know if you are getting too much omega-6s, pretty much, or if you are getting enough omega-3s. So the omega-3 index looks, looks at the amount of DHA and EPA in your red blood cells and um, the lowest heart disease and Alzheimer's risk is with an omega-3 index above 6% I've seen in studies, but I would say that 8% is uh, like a more optimal cut-off point. So you want to have your omega-3 index at least 8% and ideally higher, you know, up to 10% would be maybe the best. And uh, if the omega-3 index is below 4%, then uh, that's, yeah, like you're getting too much of these uh, omega-6s and your body might be under higher inflammation as well because of that. So uh, a few nuts and seeds isn't going to waste your omega-3 <laughs> intake. Uh, it usually may be, so it's hard to just eat that many nuts and seeds as well for you to offset the balance in the first place. So usually in the modern diet, the omega-3 index is offset because of, uh, so uh, because of like just the industrialized food and processed food intake. And the omega-6 to 3 ratio, so the ratio between the 6 and 3 specifically, that should ideally be like 3 to 1 or less. So if the ratio is 10 to 1 as it tends to be on the modern diet, then that is, yeah, you're getting too much omega-6s. But if your ratio is 3 to 1, then that's uh, kind of a natural balance that you would achieve if you were to eat a completely natural uh, diet. And maybe like, you know, 1 to 1 is kind of unfeasible or even not something that you want to aim for because, you know, omega-6s are also considered essential fatty acids, at least the ones from nuts and seeds. So like the whole food, omega-6 uh, six fatty acids, not the ones <laughs> that you get from a processed food. Next question, if you don't have a sauna, does a very hot shower bring the same or near benefits? So uh, the benefits of the sauna come from hyperthermia, so your body temperature rises above normal. And, uh, you know, there are many ways to achieve that. You can take a hot bath. So I think hot bath is probably more effective than a shower because uh, your body temperature will rise much higher in a hot bath than in a hot shower. So the, I guess the way the water, if you're submerged in the water, then it feels, you feel the effects of the temperature much more. So the same with a, with a cold bath. So a cold bath feels very colder than a cold shower. So uh, a, a warm bath, you know, the temperature might not be even that high, but it feels super hot because of your inside the bath. But uh, does the shower give the benefits? I think it's very hard to reach hyperthermia with the hot shower because you would have to first take the hot shower for, you know, 10 minutes. And the benefits of the sauna therapy come from uh, 20 minutes in uh, 70 degrees Celsius. So uh, the same with the hot bath, you would want to be in the hot bath for you know, at least 15 to 20 minutes, I would uh, imagine. Other ways to mimic some of the benefits of the sauna would be to exercise. So cardiovascular exercise mimics a lot of the effects of uh, sauna therapy by increasing your body temperature, by increasing uh, blood flow and increasing uh, heart rate. So, uh, you know, doing cardio is the second best thing for for getting the benefits of uh, of the sauna and if you do a lot of cardio then you kind of don't need to do that much much sauna sauna either so i don't do the sauna on the days that i do cardio i do only the sauna after resistance training workouts because if you combine uh, sauna after the resistance training workout then the then it does appear to support the recovery from resistance training and actually like give greater benefits for muscle growth as well. So uh, it kind of enhances the recovery and uh, enhances the hypertrophy response. And combining the sauna with exercise also yields a greater increase in VO2 max than exercise alone. So there is some 
unique benefits that you get from the sauna as well, mostly because of probably the increase in heart rate. So if you're in a sauna, your heart rate is slightly elevated, so you're doing like low heart rate training <laughs> when you're in a sauna. And uh, if you're doing the sauna, you know, four times a week for 20 minutes, then you're racking up, you know, over an hour of uh, low heart rate training as well. Next question, does sex help increase longevity? <laughs> so that's a spicy question. I think, uh, you know, based on the research, then people who have s sex uh, generally have health, better health as well. And the older you are, and uh, especially if the older you are, so if you're able to have sex in your 60s, 80s, <laughs> maybe 90s even, then it's just, a, it's more like a sign of virility and, um, and health. So like sexual, having uh, reproductive health for longer and having a greater sexual performance in your later life is just a sign of, it's more like a biological age thing. It's like a biological youth thing. If you're sexually dysfunctional already in your 40s, then it's just a sign of usually like cardiovascular problems because erectile dysfunction is very connected to uh, heart disease and uh, Alzheimer's even. So uh, it's just kind of a reflection of overall, overall uh, like a biological health. Now, is there any causal effects from sex on longevity I, I think there might be so because sex uh, supports some aspects of physical health and uh, and it also supports emotional health and like mental health in other ways especially you know if you are with a like a I guess like a long-term partner then uh, the social capital or the emotional capital that you build emotional reserve uh, that is linked to longevity as well. So people who have like long-term relationships, whether that be friends, family, or a partner or children, then these people uh, do have a reduced risk of mortality, especially the older you are. Again, in your 40s, it matters much less, but it does appear to matter a lot more when you're 60 plus, so 60s, 70s, 80s, that's where the social and emotional reserve has a much bigger effect on um, your mortality risk so to say, and loneliness and social isolation has a much bigger effect on your mortality risk the older you are. If you're younger, then uh, it matters a bit less. But yeah, sex does have benefits for, you know, emotional health and physical health. So it does pretty much su support longevity. And uh, being able to conceive, as a, as a woman, being able to get children slightly later in life is also linked to longevity. So the women who are able to get children and they have children in their 40s they uh, tend to live longer as well than the women who um, can't conceive after 40 so that's because of again the sexual health and reproductive health being a sign of overall biological health if that makes sense next question how did you do a fat loss phase lower carbs or lower fat so i uh, yeah i mentioned in my previous video that I had lost a little bit of weight, so like two to three kilos of 100% fat. <laughs> so I, I actually gained 0 0.2 kilograms of uh, muscle in my arms and legs, and I lost just fat during this process, which uh, was, you know, very nice surprise. And um, the biggest reason for that was I was doing more exercise, cardio specifically, and I was eating slightly less calories. And yeah, I just reduce, usually I reduce fat intake uh, when I am uh, dieting because it's just easier to do that. If you reduce fat intake, your food volume stays pretty much the same. So you're not really feeling like you're dieting because you, you eat the same amount of food. You're just getting less calories, which is kind of the key to long-term weight loss success. You want to feel like you're not dieting. So that's why higher fiber, higher protein meals tend to promote weight loss much better than, than uh, the opposite because you're getting lower calories while still feeling very satiated and uh, like full from there. Whereas if you have, you know, you just eat like a cup of uh, olive oil and that's like a whole lot of uh, calories and uh, that can prevent you from losing weight. Whereas if you eat like a cup of broccoli or some vegetables, then yeah, you're going to feel quite full after that. So I always like to reduce the fat because I don't notice any benefits from a high fat intake. Like I'm, I notice a much bigger benefit from a higher carb intake personally me so i always keep my protein relatively high i did reduce the protein this time as well and i didn't lose muscle which is also like surprising and i guess uh, a good thing and uh, carbs have you know benefits for just you're able to maintain a higher physical performance and uh, maintaining the higher physical performance is also important for muscle preservation so if you 
go on a diet, you lose weight, and you lose strength, your like strength at the gym goes down, then uh, that also like accelerates the muscle uh, loss. But if you're able to still put out relatively the same amount of uh, you know weight at the gym and intensity, then you're able to maintain the muscle as well much better because the intensity of the exercise is one of the biggest determinants of muscle preservation and muscle growth. So if you're even on like a completely zero calorie intake, but you exercise, you lose a lot less muscle than if you're on a zero calorie <laughs> diet and not exercising, if that makes sense. Because the muscle needs a signal to uh, stay around and the exercise intensity is the bigger, biggest determinant of uh, muscle preservation. So yeah, that's what I, how I do it. I just reduce the fat and it's uh, very easy for me. Next question, I'd like to gain weight healthy. Do you have any recommendations for the food training? So the most important thing to gaining weight in a healthy way is to do resistance training. <laughs> so I guess, you know, you want to gain weight and uh, by that you mean gain muscle because, you know, no one really wants to gain fat mass and, uh, and it's uh, much unhealthier to gain extra fat mass for no reason. Whereas gaining muscle typically results in a net positive effect on your uh, health and most people don't have that much muscle so like average people don't have they have like a muscle deficit in most cases and uh, they have too much fat mass so gaining weight in a healthy way is to do resistance training because that's the single most important thing for muscle growth so if you just eat calories and you don't lift weights then you're just going to gain weight uh, from the fat mass but if you do have the signal from the resistance training then the extra calories that you eat would be more allocated towards muscle growth so that is the most important thing that you need to do so like three times a week some form of resistance training that is going to be the most important signal for muscle growth and the extra calories so you still so it depends on where you're starting from if you're like a beginner at the gym then you can gain muscle even without being in a calorie surplus because it's like a period of newbie gains as it's called now if you're more advanced and uh, you're already lifting weights then it's going to be harder to gain muscle in a calorie maintenance phase. So you would need to increase your calories slightly. The surplus doesn't have to be very large. Anything above 500 extra calories per day would already be predominantly going into fat mass. So just increase your calories by 500 calories per day. That's the most, even like 200 is enough in a lot of cases. But yeah, 200 extra calories per day. And uh, it doesn't even have to be protein that you increase so you just want to aim for the 1.6 grams per kilogram of lean body mass for protein for maximum muscle growth benefits, which is 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. And that is lean body mass. So there's a few, you know, like 10, 15% of your body weight is still going to be fat mass for, for most people. So uh, kind of subtract that. So if you aim for like 0.7, 1.5 grams per kilogram, uh, for total body mass, then you're going to aim for that, you're going to get that amount. So you don't need to eat any more protein than that. So the extra 500 calories you would want to aim for will come from either fats or carbs. Now, I personally believe that being in a surplus, surplus with carbohydrates would be more beneficial because uh, carbs have a direct like uh, link with uh, muscle growth and uh, kind of more positive weight gain in that scenario. So uh, fat doesn't really have that much of a role to play in muscle growth. Yes, you need certain essential fatty acids, but you can cover that from a, like a relatively low amount of fat. So like if you eat 70 to 80 grams of fat per day, then you're getting all the essential fatty acids that your body needs. And the rest of the calories for optimal muscle growth would come from uh, carbohydrates. So the uh, insulin and uh, the glycogen replenishment from carbs, it has a kind of a it's a league of its own in terms of muscle growth. So just the anabolic effects of insulin are quite effective in a small surplus and uh, the glycogen replenishment as well would just give you better performance at the gym. And if you perform better at the gym, you're going to build more muscle as well. So I guess that's kind of my recommendations for you know, optimal macros and uh, workout as well. Next question, are you planning to start taking rapamycin? So I'm currently not taking rapamycin. It's this uh, considered to be one of the most, I guess, uh, biggest potential for having a life extension in humans as a pharmaceutical. So I'm not taking it right now. I'm waiting for a few more studies to come out before I start taking it. I do think that it's probably going to have some longevity benefits in humans as well, especially the elderly people. So usually it's thought to be like an immunosuppressant and that's why it's considered that it might actually be harmful. 
but uh, some of the recent studies do show that it actually has benefits in strengthening the immune system in the elderly people. And I guess the difference is uh, the dosage frequency and uh, how you pulse it. So you don't want to probably take it like every day. And for longevity benefits, the recommended frequency is like once a week, a certain dose. So uh, I'll probably start doing that in a few years because right now, like I said, I'm trying to really build my physical reserve. So I'm trying to build my muscle mass, muscle strength and uh, VO2 max reserve. So I, I'm inclined to think that the rapamycin, it wouldn't support those goals. Maybe it will, but uh, you know, currently I don't need to take rapamycin at my age. So I'll, I'll wait a few years. And the same applies to my dog. <laughs> so we have the Apollo, a small Maltipoo. He's only 11 months old at the moment. And uh, we do plan to start giving him certain uh, supplements as well and uh, rapamycin because there's the dog aging project by Dr. Matt Caberlain, which has pretty interesting findings, like a preliminary findings that, yeah, the dogs that get rapamycin appear to be slightly healthier or something. Uh, but the, the results of the, those studies will also come out in a few years. So we'll wait a few years until Apollo grows up a little bit and then we'll consider giving him rapamycin as well. And the same for me, I'm gonna wait for the dog study to see um, like whether or not I'll start taking rapamycin myself. Next question, when is your next retreat to India? Cause we're coming. So yeah, I just came back from my retreat in India at the Ivo clinic in this five-star hotel. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the best I guess biohacking experiences that I've experienced and it's just you know this 360 full assessment diagnostic assessment of your health 180 biomarkers with blood test DEXA scan VO2 max tests full body MRI all the different kind of scans liver scan ultrasound echocardiogram you know you name it whatever kind of test you want to do they'll they'll do it for you and of course also there's some other uh, like therapies IV therapy hyperbaric oxygen red light therapy uh, hydrofacial uh, PRP uh, you have dentist, uh, eye doctor, physiotherapy, massages, you know, a lot of things you can do there. And uh, seven days, I'm going to go back in uh, January 2025. So uh, January 3rd is the current uh, date that will uh, go. And you can check it out at seamland.co forward slash retreat or check the link in the description. Next question, how did you lower your LDL? So my LDL from the last blood test was... Uh, lower it was 75 milligrams per deciliter which I think is a pretty optimal at least uh, for my age so I'm not taking any pharmaceuticals I'm not taking any lipid lowering uh, drugs or anything like that this is just with uh, lifestyle and diet and a few supplements that might influence uh, LDL uh, like uh, levels but uh, the biggest thing that I did was just reduction in saturated fat intake so I'm just getting my fat mostly from uh, fish olive oil and uh, a few nuts and seeds so these are the only like fats that i really consume i also consume like dairy but dairy doesn't appear to influence ldl uh, as much as uh, some other fats so like uh, more animal-based fats like uh, butter or stuff so yeah i think that's the only things that i did i did take some psyllium husk as well as a, like a food additive on my on my food but uh, i think that was the biggest uh, changes i also exercised a lot more so Exercise is important for uh, lipid panel and uh, maybe the sunlight exposure during the summer also might have affected that because your body converts the cholesterol in your blood to vitamin D3 sulfate. So if your cholesterol is high, then it might be that you're not getting this um, infrared radiation from the sunlight. So yeah, these are the few things that I think were responsible. Next question, top five things that improved your sleep. So I've always had relatively good sleep. I've never struggled with sleep. I've actually done some, you know, weird sleep experiments like uh, doing the polyphasic sleep where I sleep four hours a night and uh, have multiple naps. So, uh, you know, I've even, even after that, I never struggled with insomnia or some sleeping issues. So uh, what are the things that I do notice that improve my sleep? I'm getting very high scores with my sleep tracker. So always like above 90s and... Um, I think the biggest thing is exercise. So just exercising a lot more, I notice has a, the biggest effect on how long I sleep and how well I sleep. So always on the days that I do exercise, you know, at least 30 minutes, I sleep better and I sleep longer. Whereas on the days that I don't exercise, my sleep demand is so low that I sometimes just end up sleeping 
three, four hours and I wake up and I feel just normal. So if I don't exercise, then I don't need to sleep either almost, at least based on how I feel. And if I do exercise, then I sleep very uh, well. So number one is exercise. And there is studies that the higher amount of physical activity you do, the greater sleep quality you have. So the extreme exercisers even, they report the best sleep quality, probably because their sleep pressure and sleep drive is much higher. So the more exercise you do and the more sunlight you're exposed to, the higher your uh, sleep pressure is. So do some exercise, get some sunlight. I think those are the top two biggest uh, determinants of sleep quality. Number three is uh, the blue light routine. So in the evening, you want to limit blue light exposure, artificial light exposure. So these kind of uh, computer screens, uh, UV lights and uh, smartphones, they do reduce melatonin production. And um, it doesn't affect me that much, but uh, I, do, I do remember when I started using the blue blockers, I noticed that my deep sleep increased by 15%. So before it was 15% lower, after I started using the blue blocking glasses, it was 15% 15, 15 higher. So yeah, that is uh, quite underrated in my opinion. Number four is uh, earlier time restricted eating. So uh, I've sometimes in the past, I have eaten you know, one hour before bed, two hours before bed. Right now I'm actually like four or five hours before bed and I notice that my sleep is better if I eat a bit earlier. So if you have your dinner too late, then uh, it tends to reduce your sleep quality. Even if you kind of don't feel it, your sleep tracker will still be with worse results. Even if you don't like feel that you're sleeping worse, your sleep tracker will still, <laughs> still show you that you're getting slightly less deep sleep or REM sleep, whatever that may be. And lastly, the fifth tip was just staying in bed longer. So I'm the kind of person, you know, I'll wake up at 4 or 5 a.m. I might not feel that I want to sleep longer. And a lot of the times in the past, I just woke up and started working or something. But uh, over the last year, I've just decided to stay in bed for a bit longer. And that usually results in me sleeping for another hour. And uh, I think that is quite... You know, beneficial because I'll end up getting eight hours of sleep instead of six or seven. So I think uh, you know, getting eight hours of sleep if you're exercising regularly and uh, under higher amounts of physical stress from exercise and other things, then uh, it's more beneficial to have like at least eight hours of sleep. And just staying in bed instead of immediately getting up, <laughs> uh, you know, ends up you sleeping a bit longer as well, based on my experience. So the, these are the top things that have affected my sleep uh, the most. Next question, what oil do you use to fry your sweet potato fries? <laughs> so I don't, you know, do any like this kind of classical sweet potato fries or anything like that. I just chop the sweet potato into these uh, circles. I put them on the oven, on this uh, baking sheet, and I just cook them in the oven in two, 200 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. And it, I mean, it's not fries as in the same way as McDonald's fries or something like that, because they're not very fatty or crispy, but they are do develop a slight crunch to them so you know this is kind of healthy my sweet potato fry version so I don't use any oil for that I just use the sweet potato maybe a little bit of salt and I mean sometimes I might add a little bit of olive oil on there but uh, very rarely so in most cases it's just the regular sweet potato and you can actually get yeah like quite legitimate you know crunchy sweet potatoes or you know kind of semi fries <laughs> not the real thing but uh, they taste uh, really good if you just uh, cook them like that. Next question, thoughts on astaxanthin daily dose. So astaxanthin, in uh, my opinion, is uh, a very interesting supplement and uh, I have become more interested in it over the last few months, mostly because I've seen uh, a few of these meta-analyses of clinical trials that uh, astaxanthin helps with blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, cholesterol, and uh, inflammation. But the reason I am taking it is because of uh, the skin uh, skin uh, protective effects. So astaxanthin is a carotenoid and it does protect against the UV radiation from the sun. So uh, it's, it's summer, I don't you know, use sunscreen that much. In Estonia I don't need to because there's not <laughs> that much sun and I don't go outside if the sun is like blazing. But yeah, the astaxanthin 12 milligrams a day appears to be good for skin anti-aging and uh, protecting the skin against UV uh, radiation. So yeah, I'm taking that. And it has the other effects as well on the lipids and uh, blood pressure and inflammation. Although, you know, I don't have uh, problems uh, with those markers. And the last question is, do you take Novos Core supplement? 
So the NovaScore supplement, it uh, is supposedly targeting uh, these different hallmarks of aging. It has calcium, alpha-ketoglutarate, magnesium, malate, vitamin C, physetin, and uh, lithium, so a few other ingredients. I do think that it's a smart product. I will make a more thorough video about the ingredients the same way I did with uh, Brian Johnson's supplement stack. So I think that it's in interesting and... Uh, I guess it's with a, with the right idea in mind and it's kind of convenient to use. I'm not exactly sure how effective it is. So because some of the ingredients uh, might not be uh, that evidence-based uh, yet. So it's hard to say which of the ingredients is the most effective out of those uh, entire list of ingredients. So calcium alpha ketoglutarate it has interesting animal studies, but the human studies are very uh, lacking for longevity purposes. And the calcium alpha ketoglutarate may have benefits on bone density, but that's pretty much it on uh, human trials right now. And with fisetin, there's no like human clinical trials on the senolytics, so like apigenin and quercetin. We don't know if they work in humans for reducing senescent cells, and even then, we don't know like okay, you remove senescent cells, how many of these senescent cells you need to remove, and what's the correct dosage and uh, pulsing frequency, etc. So uh, and in the recent National Institute of Aging ITP trial, the fisetin didn't extend lifespan either in uh, animals. So uh, yeah, I'll do a thorough overview of the Novascore supplement, but uh, I don't take it regularly. I do have it, some of the satchels, and I find it it's pretty convenient if you're traveling. So if you're traveling and you don't have you know all your supplements with you, then just using this single satchel can be useful for, I guess, boosting your immunity or yeah, just... Um, having like a slight antioxidant effect to counteract maybe the the uh, stress uh, from uh, traveling. So uh, that's the only way I use it, uh, but uh, that's pretty much it. All right, that's it for this episode. If you liked it, then make sure you subscribe and follow us on social media. You can also pre-order my new book, The Longevity Leap, at thelongevityleap.com.